Hello, welcome. Here, I'm going to tell you everything I can find out about the new ITV drama Beecham House and present a roundup of news. I'm actually researching the period for a book, so I hope the series encourages a lot of interest that I can ride the coattails of when I get published. Anyway, back to Beecham House. I'm going to give you a summary of the history behind the idea and some of the characters, and if there's some visual flaw in the stills or the press releases, I'll mention it, but for the most part, we will leave the actual content and decisions as to quality to the viewers. After all, you can decide whether you like something for yourselves. Leading a team of talented creators is Gurinder Chadha of Bend It Like Beckham fame. Beecham House started filming in autumn of 2018, sources tell us. Chadha believes that, quote, one family struggled to survive as the British vie with the Maharajas to claim India as their own, along with requisite below-stairs intrigue, can replicate Downton Abbey's global appeal. It's hyped already as the Downton Abbey of India, set in Delhi at the end of the 18th century. It follows the lives of wealthy residents of Beecham House and their staff, and is set to be released in early sources posted online also reveals that it is being filmed in Jaipur in northwestern India, a favourite place to film lavish productions filled with stunning scenery and significant historical landmarks. According to the ITV Press Centre, quote, Chatter's story centres on John Beecham, played by Tom Bateman, a former soldier and trader with the all-powerful East India Company, haunted by his past, aren't they all, who hopes to start a new life for himself and his family as the Mughal Empire comes to a close. Unquote. John Beecham is described as, quote, enigmatic, and a handsome former soldier who has purchased the magnificent mansion Beecham House to begin a new life with his family. What family, we ask ourselves? The soulful John will doubtless be a moral compass for British viewers as he tries to escape his colonial past with the company and strike out on his own. The press centre continues to add mystery to his potentially meaty part, introducing the young olive-skinned child named August, who is possibly John's son. He appears in the diverse household and the question quickly becomes, is one of his ayahs, the Indian nannies, actually the boy's mother? It is hoped by the filmmakers that, quote, the vibrant cast of British and Indian actors, unquote, will hopefully show the sweep of Indian society in the late 18th century. Leslie Nicholl from Downton Abbey is John's robust, interfering mother, Henrietta, who has travelled from England to India to stay with her son. We all love a loving mother. She will doubtless provide an establishment counterpoint and will apparently try to set John up with her British companion. Well, I'm sure she loves him anyway. Another interesting character could be the French mercenary, General Castillon, played by Gregory Fitoussi, and he is a soldier in the Mughal service. He's going to be an antagonist for the hero who will try to stop a trading license being granted to soulful John B. There are several potential love interests for the hero, and as many rivals, with a few subplot intrigues, plus the added yay value of Kebir Bedi as a Maharaja, a role he was born to play. In a nutshell, therefore, we have the ingredients for a polished drama. The questions are, who are August's parents? What is John's past? Can he rehabilitate himself, or will his past catch up to him? And who will he inevitably choose as his love interest, or indeed, choose him? In terms of look, it's a big budget production. It's a, it's a statement piece. Chandra cites the quality series and movies of the 1970s as her inspiration. She says that I grew up with the Raj dramas like Jewel and the Crown, The Far Pavilions, and A Passage to India, all stellar stuff. Beecham House is my chance, she says, to tell these stories from a British agent's perspective. One article online says that great care has been taken to ensure that the wardrobe is authentic to the silhouettes of the time. Now, what about that history I was talking about earlier? Well, we should get to it at some point. Let's start now, and we'll begin by a quick summary of the difference between the company and the Raj. A common mistake is to think that the Raj refers to the whole history of the British Empire in India. In fact, it only accounts for the period of imperial government from 
1858 to 1947, during the much longer period of control previous to that, which dates roughly from 1757 to 1858. Note, this is not the entire period of British residence in India, only the time of their greatest control. Almost all of present-day India came under the control of a private enterprise called the East India Company. Previous to this, the company, as it was known, had grown from a small group of chartered merchants in 1603 into a political power in the subcontinent. It is during the days of British expansion under the company that Beecham House is set. Some differences between the company and the Raj were that the company appointed governors general and the Raj appointed viceroys. The company was controlled by several boards in London, which after the acts of 1773 and 1784, they were answerable to the cabinet in Whitehall and something called the Board of Control. Before 1796, the company allowed great leeway in letting its employees mix with the Indian people and delegated administrative positions of great importance to Indians. The company post-1796 and the Raj took a much dimmer view of governing India for or with India, and if the series does its homework, you should get to see some interesting scenarios play out around some of these issues. An interesting facet of company control in India, especially uh, around this time, is the Orientalists and White Mughals. The British in India between the 1770s and the end of the 18th century were quite capable of integrating themselves into Indian society. Generals Stuart and Okchalorni adopted Indian habits, language, and ways of living. Many married Indian women and had families. General Malcolm argued that the British should administer India for India and not for imperial advancement. Scholarly men arrived in India and began chronicling its history after unearthing huge, forgotten chunks of recorded memory that were thought lost. One British officer even used to spend hours visiting and talking with his sepoys, the native soldiers, so as to gain their trust and respect. These were the so-called Orientalists and White Mughals. The Stachi Saab culture, that is represented by the Raj, is the stereotype. But at the time the series is set, you should not be surprised to see a lot of British invaders adapting to India rather than making India adapt to them. The series takes place in the 1790s in Delhi, which was the old centre of the Mughal Empire. News reports speak of the show being set in the time of the twilight of the Mughals, and that's accurate. Beecham House is supposed to be a mansion in Delhi, and John Beecham is a trader looking to go independent. The Mughal state fell into decline in the years after the death of the Emperor Aurangzeb in 1707. By the 1760s, Mughal power had receded almost exclusively to northern India. It was being eclipsed by the British to the east and the Marathas to the south. By the 1790s, the Marathas had gained ascendancy over Delhi and the Emperor, a prize which they quarrelled over with the Afghans. The British were firmly entrenched in Bengal, Madras and Bombay, and were expanding across southern and central India. It's surprising, therefore, that Delhi is the place that this series is set. Mr Beecham has chosen to go, presumably, because he wants to escape the strings of the company. So actually it makes sense at the same time as being a little confusing. Nevertheless, despite the large amount of British people appearing around the country, the company had little interest in Delhi at that time, mostly because of difficult relations with the Maratha Confederacy, who pretty much ran Delhi. So Lucknow in Oud might have been a more apt place to set Beecham House and for John to seek his fortune. A lot of mercenaries and adventurers did go there, nevertheless, especially at this time. And that brings up another thorny topic. If Mr. Soulful B goes off to try and start his own trading company. He's actually looking for trouble. Everybody loves a bad boy, but the EIC had a charter and a legal monopoly on trade in India. It was absolutely illegal to operate a trading company in competition with the EIC. So Mr. B is going to be putting a lot of noses royally out of joint in East India Company headquarters at Leadenhall Street in London. As we've mentioned, there were a lot of mercenaries in India, lots of them, 
but in fact the majority of them were Europeans. Before 1796 they could work for whoever they chose. The EIC took them, and so did the Indian rulers. By the time of Beecham House, the most famous mercenaries were to be found in the Maratha court and at Hyderabad, with others serving in Mysore and some of the smaller powers in the south. The Mughals weren't even close to being a military power anymore, and officers like the famous Benoit de Bois, Raymond, and others gravitated to the other princes of India for this reason. There's no denying that the mercenaries got everywhere, but Delhi wasn't exactly a place to win fame. Another downside for any princes taking in European mercenaries was the quarrel between Britain and France. That being what it was, any Indian state that employed French soldiers between 1790 and 1800 could expect a demand to fire them or fight the British. Now we go on to the reforms of Cornwallis. Now Cornwallis was the fellow who lost to Washington at Yorktown, but he was also the man who reformed the EIC in India into the working model that would carry it down to 1857. So, in hindsight, a bit of a mixed bag. His reforms placed the company more squarely under the crown and the cabinet. He did away with the practice of appointing native-born Indians and men of mixed birth to civil and military posts, which was quite unfair. In 1790, though, these reforms were not yet in force, but they were coming, and this changing face of the company was in part directly because of the Orientalists. If the series touches on this change, it will be worthy of some applause. Now I'm going to do some predictions. Touted as the new Downton Abbey, that could be risky. Downton Abbey in India may not appeal as greatly to the United States, which was one of the main consumers that boosted Downton Abbey into the stratosphere. Channel 4 also acts its 14 million pound prestige drama, Indian Summers, after two seasons. There's also a danger that it will be too Raj and not company enough. We should be looking for Jane Austen and Georgette Hare in India rather than Downton Abbey. I think it's interesting that some plot points can be gathered from the way the, the characters are posing. I've played Connect the Dots with them, and here are my theories. John Beecham is at the centre, and he's holding a baby in his arms. He has the baby under his protection, only he knows why. He is the only actor looking directly at the camera, suggesting that his main motivation will be the protection of this baby. Beside him on his left is Margaret Osborne, a governess in his Indian neighbor's household. She's very Raj of them. She is looking at John with some admiration. There's no secret about that. She's one of his possible love interests. Behind her are two Indian servants. One is also staring at him, while the one to his left, an ayah, is more interested in the baby. Over John's right shoulder is an imposing bearded man wearing a uniform. Note here that beards weren't fashionable amongst Europeans at this time, and the uniform they've given him is absurd. I believe this to be the French mercenary General Castillon. He seems intensely interested in Miss Osborne, either that or he is glaring at John. After all, he is the advertised villain. Also looking her way, Perhaps at John, or towards the baby, but pretending otherwise is the officer in the red coat. This, I believe, is John Beecham's estranged brother. The beautiful Aya beside him is hardly subtle in her attention, and the man to her left seems to be mildly curious as to why. While the tall mustachioed man behind the other Aya is deeply suspicious about him, the lady in the yellow sari, Princess Chandrika, is at the center of things on John's right, and she is concerned about John's mother. But the mother in question is very much the cat who got the canary, so we might gather that she has something on the princess. Behind them, Mrs. Beecham's companion, who she will have designs on for her son, is sharing a glance with John's best friend, another ex-company man. Now, from all that, you should gather that there is a lot of scope to tell an intriguing British Asian story, and it is an attempt to get Anglo-Indian history on screen again. What should you do to get excited about this series? Well, first, make sure and read William Dalrymple's White Moogles ahead of time. Maybe try and watch one or two of those early Raj series the creator was inspired by. Don't get too upset or carried away with the accuracy at this stage or when you're watching it. When you do watch it, ask questions, but remember not to take everything either too seriously or at face value. Make a differentiation between parts that are entertainment and parts that are history. If you watch the series and are curious about the history behind it, or anything you see, let me know on Twitter or in the comments here, and I'll try and help you out with questions, content, or book suggestions. 
when a full trailer hits, I'll talk about it more. For now, this has been Josh at Adventures in History Land. Thank you for watching.